people who are curious about my position should look at my unheard essay from November of 2021, which I posted a link to on uh, Twitter yesterday, but it's called something like the liberal case for gun ownership. I'll put it in the show notes. So yeah, it'll, it'll be in the show notes. Mm -hmm. um, in any case, I make the argument in that piece that the gun control advocates are, and this is going to make uh, others bristle, but hear me out. Gun control advocates are actually correct about the role that ubiquitous gun ownership in the U.S. has on these shootings. I'm not arguing that this is the only component, but that it is a necessary component for these shootings to be uh, as common as they have become. The question is, what does the world look like if we were to regard the Second Amendment as an error and we were to do something like Australia did with its buyback after they had a massacre? Um, and that's the part that I think changes the equation dramatically. All right. So the argument I made in that article is that actually, despite the fact that the public is not in a position to... Um, to fend off tyranny in a fair fight, it is in a position to drive tyrants uh, <coughs> into retreat, that an inferior force can often do that and has often done that. It's done, been done to the US military numerous times in recent history. And that the point is, A, the signs of tyranny have greatly increased over the last several years on all kinds of fronts, from the insane rush towards um, censoring one's opponents to demonizing people according to their race, according to their vaccination status, um, the, the official propaganda, the public-private partnerships, which is actually a euphemism for fascism, right? All of these things. You want to spell that out? Yes, the sin qua non, the, the, the signature feature of fascism is this fusion of the state and corporate power, right? That's what public-private partnership is. It's a, it's a soft peddling of fascism. And public-private partnerships, for those who, who may not recognize that phrase, uh, has, been, has been trotted out in lots of quarters recently. But uh, it, it has been promoted as this great win by the now no longer lead at the NIH, Francis Collins, um, one of whose chief agencies is, of course, the one that Fauci leads. And, you know, he and they both basically brought in and made it dominant in the funding structure of science in the United States, so-called private-public partnerships, which is code for the pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical companies have their their financial interests in the research being done, the questions that are asked, and what is then promoted and publicized in the results. Right. So we have all that. We have a ministry of truth by a slightly different name, which, okay, yes, has been put on temporary pause because we managed to mock it out of existence. But, uh, you know, <laughs> so easy to mock. Don't <laughs> kid yourself that that thing is going away. No, it's not. You know, as far as I know, the Department of Homeland Security hasn't rescinded its absurd claim that saying true things that cause people to distrust their government is uh, malinformation terrorism. So we've got the government threatening people for saying uh, facts that are inconvenient, right? The signs of tyranny are all around. Now you can say, you know, your imagination's running away with you, but how much of a risk are, do you want to take? Because at the end of the day, these massacres are completely unacceptable and tragic. But you know what else is completely unacceptable and tragic? pogroms and gas chambers and every other, you know, mass starvation, struggle sessions, all of this stuff. So, all right, those signs are all out there. And the Second Amendment plays a role in protecting us from that. What's more, the argument that was always weaker on the question of gun control, which was the right to personal self-defense, which I don't think is in the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment is phrased in a way that if I squint at it just right, it's possible that the founders were being extremely clever and that they did include it, but I don't think so. So the reason, that, the reason I say that is that this, the Second Amendment reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now you could interpret free state mm -hmm. as the state of freedom, 
It could be an individual. Right. But I don't think that's what they meant. It's a little hard to say. I believe they've capitalized the word state, which implies that it's not personal. But they also capitalized militia and arms. So maybe they were just in a capital happy mood. <laughs> they, they, Dr. They did do that. <laughs> was it Dr. Rolligator who was, maybe he's the doctor and he was at the founding and he capitalized some letters just to leave a note for us in the future. But the point being... I don't know what's happening. <laughs> uh, I'm just, we know one and only one person who's become somewhat famous for his abuse of, of the caps lock key. Well, and, that, that, that's totally different. All caps and uh, capitalizing lots of words throughout sentences is, is rather a different formulation. Could have been a prototype. We don't know how many hundreds of years he's been capitalizing and he's finally arrived at all. All right. We're going to bail out of this particular <laughs> fraction of the discussion. But basic point being, look, the self-defense side of this question was always the dicier side of the argument, right? The founders do not appear to have granted us the right to bear arms in order to defend our homes. That may be more necessary now. And especially in light, I mean, let's take our situation for a second. We live in a city where a certain number of people believe us guilty of racism, of transphobia, of, um, you know, killing people by speaking about uh, possible vaccine hazards. Now, these people are crazy. None of these things will stand up to scrutiny, but scrutiny isn't what it's about. The question is, how safe are we here? Mm -hmm. In that same city, the police have been demonized. They don't tend to show up when people face uh, threats. Their ranks are thinning. Their ranks are thinning. And so the point is, look, you can say, well, you know, nobody told you to live in Portland. And that's true. But then you own the downside of that argument. Because for this to be America, we have to have the right to live in any city in it or anywhere in it that we wish to. And our beliefs cannot be the reason that we are in physical danger, right? If you believe that our physical danger, because we live in a place where there are a concentration of crazy people who misunderstand simple logic, that that's our fault, right? Then you have uninvented America. That's your fault, right? So in any case, my point would be, I think the gun control debate, I don't expect it to end, but I think it's logically over. Because logically speaking, you cannot demonize the police and then not give people the right to defend themselves and the ability to do so. And you cannot ratchet up all of the indicators that you are intent on a tyrannical bullying of your enemies and then say, well, but the Second Amendment is irrelevant because, you know, what's it for? Well, it's for fending off tyrants. Okay, you surprised me a bit. Um, not because the logic in what you just laid out doesn't make sense. It does. Um, but because you imagine that that logic, uh, even if it were clear to all involved, uh, that anyone in a position to actually consider this uh, would pay attention. Like that's that's not the political well, machine that we live in. No, at this I, point. I said I don't expect the argument to end, but it is logically over. That the point is, those who are advocating in the face of this tragedy, which has come and will come again, right? That we must do away with these weapons, are not paying attention to the net argument on which they own the downside of all of the things that they have been doing and arguing. I suspect that there are those uh, who have been considering these issues deeply for longer than, than you have and <clears throat> to some degree than I have uh, for less time, yet uh, will argue that that has been the case many times over. That there have been there have been other events, other changes in policy and politics and culture uh, that have rendered actually these arguments long since logically over, and yet here we are still. Well, I guess what I would argue then is that an honest broker can't help but see this one, right? And I'm, I think most of the people we're arguing with are not honest brokers, but um, an honest but, broker. I mean, let, let's just try to put ourselves. One of the things, one of the places we find ourselves in the last five years is um, happily among uh, people with similar values who are on the right. Uh, whereas we just didn't um, have much opportunity to, to find ourselves among very many conservatives before. And, <clears throat> and many of the things that the you know, snarkier among the conservatives will say is this has always been what the liberals do this is always what they sound like uh there's a naivete you know that's the nice 
that's them being nice. That's them not being very snarky. But there's yeah. a naivete to liberal policies uh, that hasn't worked for all of these reasons for a very long time and wake up already. So, you know, why why do you think that this is the moment that ought to be waking people up? And oh, I didn't you know, say what, that. what what previous I, I I guess I don't I don't know the history well enough to know sort of what previous moments maybe um, there ought to have been conversions happening to understand okay this is not this is not as simple as either side would say it is. Well, look, I have no doubt that those on this side that I'm claiming has won the logical argument here will mm -hmm. say, oh yeah, we were always right, and in some sense that's true because the central issue is one of tyranny, and it may be that tyranny is on the horizon and evident now in a way that it has not been uh, maybe ever in the US before, mm -hmm. or maybe it has, but uh, fairly deeply into history. Yeah. But the, um, the fact of these things being now so ubiquitous and so aggressively on the march means that in effect that can't help but be the central issue. And if this isn't clear to people, I want to, I want to make it clear. There is nothing, as I say in my article, there is nothing that makes these massacres the slightest bit tolerable, right? There is no net argument that makes them okay. What we have is concrete deaths, tragic deaths in large numbers, but numbers that are small compared to what happens when tragedy unfolds historically, right? So we are talking about actual children whose names we know against many more children whose names we don't know because it's an abstraction until it happens, right? And so it's a tough argument to make because the concrete always uh, outweighs the abstract in such, a, in such a case, right? The tragedy, the actual tragedy that we have is very hard to compare to a tragedy that we might have. But the point is the order of magnitude of the tragedy that we risk is so great. Now, I'm not arguing that there is not a ton we could do to reduce, I don't think we can eliminate the massacre problem, but I think we can greatly reduce it if we decide to. For one thing, we have to be honest about the fact that guns may be necessary, ubiquitous guns may be necessary for this, but they are not the only thing, right? There is a thread which, of course, is now a sacred cow and we can't really talk about it. But Chris Martinson did a very good uh, analysis, I think, yesterday, uh, where he talked about pharmaceuticals and the role that they appear to play. There's strong statistical evidence that these are an important player in a majority of such cases.